Periodically when I'm visiting at home and my parents get out the, uh, some of the old albums that have pictures of Christmas time, there is a picture of me in one of those albums or in one of those collections somewhere along the way uh, on, on Christmas morning. And uh, it, it was one of those intriguing Christmas mornings where, we, uh, where there were things under the tree that had only recently come to light as being expected by the eldest and only, at that point, child. Um, we went to see, you know, that jolly old elf in, a, in Pembroke Mall of all places. He had a little house, and you went inside, and you sat on his lap, and you talked about what you wanted. And I didn't like strangers, uh, you know, at that point. We didn't have the stranger danger worry or all those kinds of things, but I didn't really like to talk to people I didn't know. So I didn't know who this dude was or why I had to sit on his lap. But he, uh, in any case, he asked me a series of questions uh, about what I wanted for Christmas. And I couldn't answer because I didn't want to talk to him. So uh, eventually he says, well, do you want a fire engine? And I said, yes. They took a picture, and I walked out. Well, there was this fire engine under the Christmas tree. And it was back in the day, this was all plastic, small pieces probably wouldn't be sold today because it would, uh, small children would probably uh, be not good for them. You know, these pieces are not allowed for children under eight. However, uh, it was totally cool because it had this little button that made the little uh, arm go up and down and up and down. And it made the wonderful siren sound, which I am sure certain individuals who may be watching right now did not appreciate. Um, you know, uh, but they didn't disable it. I, I, I still remember. But there was a look of surprise on uh, my face in one of the pictures. And the, uh, I still can see that picture of that little boy's face, it was mine, in his Footy pajamas, if you remember, you know, footy pajamas. Maybe you don't have them anymore. I certainly don't. But uh, footy pajamas, uh, and I was sitting there uh, in a cherub-like, angelic pose with my hands crossed like this because supposedly the lore goes that I was praying in thanks for the fire engine that I didn't want until Santa Claus suggested it. Uh, but the surprise of discovering that under the tree still rings true with me, that, that surprise of, of the unexpected. What do you do when the unexpected happens in our lives? Now, I want to read you a story about some people who are essentially minding their own business, doing their thing. And something intriguing happens. It will probably be somewhat familiar to you if you come from a Christian tradition uh, because it is, a, it, it is something that I will probably read to you in its entirety, this whole story, um, uh, on Christmas Eve. But until then, I'm just going to read a piece of it. And here is the piece I will read. Jesus has just been born. That's the uh, spoiler there. Uh, there were shepherds in the area living in the fields and keeping night watch by turns over their flock. The angel of God appeared to them and the glory of God shone around them and they were very much afraid. The angel said to them, you have nothing to fear. I come to proclaim good news to you News of great joy to be shared by the whole people. Today in David's city, a Savior, the Messiah, has been born to you. Let this be a sign for you. You'll find an infant wrapped in simple cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom God's favor rests. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see the event that God has made known to us. 
They hurried and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Once they saw this, they reported what they had been told concerning the child. All who heard about it were astonished at the report given by the shepherds. This is the gospel for us this morning. Praise be to God. There's this wonderful story. Shepherds doing what shepherds do. I don't know if any of you have ever been shepherds, even like as a part-time job, but it's pretty much an intriguing job where you hang out with sheep all the time. It's not like you had pens where you kept them somewhere and you could go home at night to sleep. It's kind of like a cattle drive. Uh, if you've ever seen the old westerns where they go out, at, Linda's mom tells stories about back in the day because uh, her mom, not Linda's mom, but Linda's mom's mom, uh, was in charge of the chuck wagon when they would go on a, on a, uh, to, to drive the cows. And so they would go out and Grandma Brown would fix their breakfast, their dinner for them right there on the open, uh, on the open fire and, and cook for them. But they lived for a period of time out among the cows. And the chuck wagon followed them around and fed them wherever they were. Well, I'm sorry to say for shepherds in the first century, there was no chuck wagon that followed them around from place to place. And there were no pens, so you couldn't leave the sheep to do their own thing and go back home. You lived with and stayed with the sheep all the time. Uh, somebody had to sleep, somebody had to eat, uh, uh, but somebody had to always be paying attention because sheep are apparently pretty tasty to other critters, the kind that are carnivores. And so uh, if you're not paying attention, one of those carnivores might just come up and take one of the sheep or several uh, with them. And if your livelihood is based on those sheep, you're going to watch for it. So you're going to be, so pretty much the job of a shepherd is to live out with the sheep and follow them around from place to place. Your life is based on the life of the sheep. There's food to eat here. We're going to stop here. Uh, there are still, when I was in Israel in the 1990s, there are still Bedouin tribes that go from place to place driving their sheep uh, on, uh, uh, from, from place to place all over Israel looking for grazing land. And they have specific caves that are located in different locations where they can put the sheep at night. Uh, and so it's, it's really intriguing that in 2,000 years not a whole lot has changed. Uh, in some places anyway about keeping sheep. So you can imagine if you're a, a shepherd, it's just to give you a little background about shepherds, your whole life was spent with sheep. Have you ever been around sheep? Like, you know, sheep in, you know, in their pen or out there? Uh, they, yes, Marge is exactly right. If you couldn't hear her online, Marge said, they stink. They have a very strong odor, very strong odor about them. And I guess if you're around them long enough, your, your nose turns off, you don't smell it anymore. But anybody else would notice, oh, that's a shepherd coming into town uh, because of the smell that you carried with you wherever you went. And so it was shepherds, while they did something really important, were not looked upon particularly highly. And when it came to the religious life, they were complete outsiders. You would have thought shepherds were insiders. We talk about God as the good shepherd. We talk about, there's lots of images of shepherds in the Bible. But shepherds were outsiders. Because by the time uh, that Jesus was born, roughly in the first century, religion had gotten really kind of uh, an us and them kind of feel to it. I, I know that you're not at all experiencing that in the in the. 21st century at all, that there's an us and them feel. But imagine that the insiders in the church are for the first century in religious, in, Ju in the Ju Judaic religion, the Jewish religion, would see the insiders as those who kept the cleanliness laws. For us in the 21st century, those who kept the morality laws, whatever morality you think is moral, and from church to church it seems to change, and who's the insider and who's the outsider seems to change. But imagine that those shepherds were like 
just about anybody who doesn't go to church on Sunday these days. Those people, they were the thems of the world. Oh, you're talking about them. Whoever them are, and say it with that exact same tone, them. They're shepherds. And you didn't even have to wonder if they were shepherds because you smelled them when they came into town. So you knew, particularly if your religion is about being clean, at least the appearance of outward cleanliness, that shepherds didn't cut it. So you can imagine the surprise of the shepherds out watching the sheep. I mean, it's a double surprise. How often have you been, you know, doing your normal thing and suddenly an angel appears and says, Hello! Behold, I bring you great tidings! Boom! I suspect for most of you the answer is never. <laughs> uh, but if you have, we'd be interested in hearing about that afterwards. Of course, if you relate that to us, and if you relate to the right people, they'll send people with white coats to take you away to a place that you've been talking to angels recently, have you? Well, in the first century, those shepherds were surprised, and beyond surprised, they were afraid. But second of all, they get some news that really would have been unexpected for a shepherd from a religious perspective in the first century. And that is, behold, I, don't be afraid. Every time the angels appear, that's pretty much the story. Don't be afraid. They have to say that. Whatever they look like, they don't look like that cute one that's on top of our tree here. Because I don't know anybody who'd be afraid of that. But... You know, if you read the biblical, you know, descriptions, multiple wings, they sound like, they, they sound like the best or the worst of the Dungeons and Dragons creatures that might attack your party when you're not uh, prepared. Uh, when you're taking a nap and your armor's laying in a pile next to you, that's, the what, that's what you expect. That's what these angels must have looked like because they show up and everybody's scared. But the news that is uh, received by them is certainly unexpected news. And the unexpected news is this is a good tiding not only for you, but for all people. For all people. And I'm announcing it to you, the nobody outsiders don't fit into religious people. And why? Because you have meaning. You have importance. You have value. I don't care what the religious people tell you about your value because they don't have uh, the only understanding of who God is, of who I am, the angels might have said. They don't have the only understanding because we've got good news and it's for everybody. It's for everybody. And that everybody is... You, too. You, online, too. And that good news is that God uh, wants to bring peace, healing, hope, reconciliation to everyone, to everyone everywhere. Now, that's great news. That's great news. If we were really good at sharing it, everybody would feel good about it. But we're pretty good about deciding who's inside and outside. We are no different than first century Pharisees, most of the time, at least part of the time. Well, some of the time. Well, it depends on who you are. Sometimes you're not really good at it ever. In this world, what we expect is that everyone will treat us the same way that they've always treated us. If we felt like an outsider our whole lives, we expect to be treated like an outsider. If we've been respected our whole lives, we expect to be respected. If we've lived like shepherds all of our lives, then when God shows up, we are totally surprised, maybe shocked. And we've got to see this thing. You notice what the shepherds do? First thing they do, hey, let's go see this. Let's go see this. It can't possibly be true. And they go and find a baby wrapped in plain clothes, lying in a manger, and their lives are changed. Because what we expect from Christmas sometimes makes us miss the point. But sometimes, sometimes they're surprised. Sometimes we're surprised. 
You know, part of the reason I, I asked James this month that we sing only Christmas carols. And he was kind to me, and that's what we'll be singing all month long. But I want you to listen to the words of the Christmas carols as we sing them. And if you happen to be going out somewhere, if you work in a public place, chances are pretty good you're going to hear some Christmassy carols, whether they're with words or not. If you go to a mall, they're going to be playing all the time. You know, uh, listen to the words and, and listen to what they say. Because if you listen closely, if you read the words, if you think about what's being said about the truth of what Christmas is all about, you might be surprised to discover that the good news isn't just for shepherds in the first century. And it's not just for us at St. James, or for any other church for that matter. It seems to be for everyone. And that's a good surprise. We live in a time when people are completely disillusioned, are becoming more and more disillusioned with every traditional institution there is, and that includes the church. They're not interested. They don't trust the institution to do what they... We are at a low, all-time low, although, you know, if it keeps... It could keep going down, I suppose, in terms of the trust that we have for Congress, for the presidency, and now for the judiciary at the lowest level of trust of all of our institutions. And this is just statistical truth. But the church is one of those institutions that people don't trust anymore. They don't trust us because we haven't always proclaimed good news. We told you how to get your life fixed morally because after all, the church, if nothing else, seems to be moral police. But we didn't help you discover meaning. And people are starting to realize that they have plenty of meaning without coming to a building, singing some songs, hearing a sermon that makes them feel bad, and then going back into the world. Who wants that? I don't. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. Why would you show up for something like that week after week after week? I talk to more and more disillusioned people all the time who say, why would I go to church? I don't need anybody else to tell me I was bad. My parents did. My teachers did. Law enforcement did. Or whoever else told them they weren't that good. I don't need to hear it every Sunday. And who would? Most of us here don't need to be reminded that we make mistakes. What we need to be reminded of is that in spite of our mistakes, and sometimes because of them, we actually discover that we're valuable, not because of how good we are, but just because we are. Surprise! Christmas is the surprise that says you are valuable. Everybody else says you're a shepherd. You're a nobody. You stink. And there may be a lot of people that say that, but not God. God says, surprise, I've got some good news for you and for everybody. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you smell like. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. I don't care if you make 15 before the end of the sermon. I'm going to love you. That's the message I need you to hear. I need your story to get bigger. I need your story to have meaning. Not because it's just your story, but it's because it's a part of the story. The big story that began with the beginnings of the universe and continues on. The God of everything. And it's infinite. Infinitely loves you. Infinitely loves you. And thinks you're precious beyond measure. And that's when you make mistakes and when you don't. That's when you trip and fall flat on your face and when you don't. I'd like to tell you that as your pastor, I stand firm on these two bad boys all the time. Now, besides the fact I'm getting older and my uh, balance isn't quite what it once was when I was a younger man, I trip all the time. 
I get angry over stupid things. I say things I probably shouldn't say still. Linda is exceptionally forgiving and loving and lets some of those things slide, particularly after I've, uh, you know, apologized for making those mistakes. But you see, even before you've apologized, God still loves you. God isn't waiting for your apology to love you. To be fully reconciled, perhaps that apology is important. But to be loved, there's nothing you can do to lose it. Nothing. Surprise, shepherds. Surprise. Surprise. I don't know what you're expecting from life. I don't know how many years you expect to live or what kind of difference you hoped to make or whether you're wondering, like most people are, whether they have meaning or not. Perhaps you feel all alone in the world and you feel like nobody loves you. And if you do, statistically, apparently 61% of Americans feel lonely. 61%, six in 10 Americans feel lonely. So of the people sitting in this room, six out of 10 of you may feel all alone and lonely. And even if you're in a significant relationship, you could still feel alone and lonely. There are times when you and the significant people in your life don't see things eye to eye, when you seem to feel like you're on a different path than they are. And so when you speak, they don't hear your language anymore. Shepherds had to feel lonely. The only people that understood shepherds were other shepherds. Until suddenly, this light appeared in the sky. And the God of the entire universe had sent a messenger to say, Behold, I bring you good news, which shall be for all people. Born to you this day in David's city, Bethlehem is the Messiah for you. Not just for the religious people, not just for the people that look like you, not just for the people who are from your nation, for all people, for everyone, all the time. Everyone matters. Christmas, if, if, if we don't know anything else about Christmas, Christmas says everyone matters. People that you cannot stand. And there are some of them that if you turn on the news and they're talking, turn it right back off. No matter which side of the aisle you're on. No matter what political path you walk. There's somebody you can't stand. And you have code words to talk about how you can't stand them. But in the end, Christmas says, surprise, you matter. But surprise, everyone matters. Everyone. The light is coming into the world. The light. And the light illumines the fact that everybody has feet of clay. Everybody trips and falls. Everybody is less than they could be sometimes. Everybody. And they're loved anyway. Anyway. Doesn't make a lick of sense to me. And yet it's true. Because that's who God is. That's what the Christmas story is. So if you weren't expecting Christmas to be about love, change your expectations. Change your expectations. Because surprise, I've got good news for everybody. You're loved. Unconditionally, you're infinitely precious. All of you. Christmas. At least, that's how I see it. 
Wondering if there are any additional prayer requests. I know, oh, I see that there are more on the list, clearly. Okay. I figured you were going to give them to me, and then I was going to realize I had set my glasses down over here. <laughs> so I could make up a couple of prayer requests, but maybe it would be good if I could actually see them. First of all, in the roller coaster ride that is David's life, he's back in the hospital. Um, and uh, he's having trouble holding food down, and so David, chances are pretty good he's watching us. David, know that we're praying for you, and we're keeping you and Donnie in our prayers. Um, I also want us to be praying for all of the children and families who will receive the gifts that St. James is providing through the angel tree. You can see these gifts that are underneath our Christmas tree here at this building, they're going away today. And the reason they're going away is they're going to families and children who might not otherwise get something at Christmas time. And so we are delighted to be a part of making that difference in a child's life. So I want us to be praying for them. And I guess if I were going to extend it just a little bit, I want us to be praying as well for uh, the families that are served by the West End Food Pantry. Because um, there has really never been a time in my life when I knew what hunger looked like, where I wondered exactly where my next meal was. There were some times when I ate some unsavory things because that's what I could afford to eat. Um, but truth be told, I've never known what it was like to not know where my next meal might come from. And I can't imagine what that would be like if it was just me, but what it would be like for my family if I felt responsible for them getting enough food. Um, we are doing the Christmas box challenge again this year. The, the PDF, well, I had to turn it into a JPEG, which created a great challenge, um, should be on the Facebook page later today, and I'll forward it to James, and we can post it on the website as well. Um, if you want to be a part of the Christmas challenge where we fill a box with food and bring it somewhere around Christmas time. And it just augments what we put uh, in the West End food pantry shelves to give to our neighbors. Uh, so let's pray. We'll begin in a moment of silent prayer. I'll pray out loud and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, a version of which will appear on the screen behind me. Let's enter into a moment of silent prayer. Gracious and loving God, Christmas is a tremendous gift to us. You became one of us in your son Jesus at Christmas time. We got to see what love looks like as a person. And to know that because we saw it as a person that we as persons could also act out that love in our everyday lives. Now we forget it. It slips from our mind. Uh, we need reminders from now, you know, from, from time to time. And yet the surprise of those first shepherds at hearing the words, you matter. In the eternal scheme of things, you have meaning and you fit into the bigger story of meaning. It's something we all need to know. In the midst of our alienation, brokenness, loneliness in the world in which we live. We pray, O oh God, that we would find in you the reminder that we are loved, that we might find it in one another, 
that we are loved, that we won't be so caught up in our tribal stories, in our nationalistic stories, that we would lose track of the fact that a group of first century nobodies were the first ones to hear the news proclaimed from the skies. You matter. And I've got a gift for you, born for you in Bethlehem. The gift that keeps on giving even today to all of us. We pray, O oh God, that we would be your hands, feet, eyes, mouthpiece in this world, proclaiming nothing but your love. Nothing but your love. Nothing else needs to come out of our mouths as your followers but your love. You can figure out the rest. We certainly can. Lord, we, we pray for the roller coaster ride that David and Donnie are on with his hospitalization and coming out and in. And we pray that he would find wholeness and healing in this time and strength and courage. Be present with him, be his encourager there in Virginia Hospital Center. We do pray for everyone who will receive the gifts that we've put under our tree here, and we pray for all those who will receive food from the West End Food Pantry, for all those in need in the world, for all those who have been made to feel that they are outsiders. We hear the story. Surprise, there aren't any outsiders. I love you all, period. And so it is we lift all of these prayers to you in the precious and holy name of your Son, knowing that every day we don't know what to expect, but trusting that every day your love will sustain us. And it's in the name of that Son, Jesus, that we pray now the prayer he modeled for us when he grew up. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>